Ever wondered how many types of verbs exist in English? Well, buckle up, because we're about to embark on a linguistic journey. Verbs are the backbone of any language. They give our sentences purpose and direction. Whether you want to express an action, a condition, or an occurrence, verbs are your go-to tools. Understanding the different types of verbs can enrich your language skills, making your conversations, writings, and overall communication more effective and engaging. Today, we will delve into the fascinating world of English verbs. First on our list are action verbs, the doers in our sentences. Action verbs, as the name suggests, are all about action. They're the words in our sentences that tell us what's happening, what the subject is doing. They bring movement, they bring life, and they bring dynamism into our language. Now, when we talk about action verbs, we're not just talking about physical action. Sure, words like run, jump, and swim are action verbs. They're the kind of words that make you think of someone in motion. But action verbs can also represent mental action. Words like think, dream, or consider are also action verbs. They might not get your heart rate up, but they certainly get your brain in gear. Let's take a look at some examples. Emma runs every morning. Here, runs is the action verb. It's what Emma is doing. It's a physical action that we can envision. Now consider this sentence. George dreams of becoming an astronaut. In this case, dreams is the action verb. It's what George is doing, even though it's a mental action. You see, action verbs are not just about physical movement. They're about the things we do, whether it's something we do with our bodies or something we do with our minds. Action verbs are the heart of our sentences, pumping life into our words and ideas. They're the catalysts that propel our thoughts forward and turn our static ideas into dynamic narratives. They're the spark that ignites the engine of language, the motor that drives our sentences forward. So next time you write a sentence or speak a line, think about the action verbs. Are they physical or mental? Are they bringing your ideas to life, giving them movement and dynamism? Are they propelling your thoughts forward, turning your static ideas into dynamic narratives? So remember, action verbs show us the action in the sentence. They're the doers, the movers, and the shakers of language, and that's why they're first on our list. Next, we have linking verbs, the connectors of our sentences. These handy little tools are linguistic bridges that help to give more depth and detail to our subjects. So what exactly are linking verbs? Well, in a nutshell, they connect the subject of the sentence to additional information about that subject. They don't express action like action verbs do. Instead, they provide us with more insight into the subject's state of being or condition. Let's dive into some examples for a clearer picture. Consider the sentence, the sky is blue. Here is is our linking verb, connecting the sky, our subject, with blue. Additional information about the subject. The verb is does not show any action. It simply links the subject to its description. A few common linking verbs you might recognize include is, are, was, were, seem, appear, feel, become, and remain. These verbs form the backbone of our sentences, linking the subject to its complement. Now, let's take a closer look at how linking verbs work. In the sentence, John seems tired, John is our subject, seems is our linking verb, and tired is the subject complement, the extra information about John. The linking verb seems enables us to describe John's condition or state of being. It's also important to note that some verbs can act as both action verbs and linking verbs depending on the context. Take the verb feel for instance. In the sentence, I feel the wall, feel is an action verb because it's describing a physical action. But in the sentence, I feel tired, feel is a linking verb, connecting the subject I to the subject complement tired. Linking verbs then serve as bridges in our sentences, connecting different pieces of information. They allow us to express more than just actions, but also states of being, conditions, and appearances. They give our sentences depth, painting a more vivid picture of our subjects. So next time you're crafting a sentence, remember these linguistic bridges and use them to your advantage. Moving on, let's talk about auxiliary verbs, our sentence helpers. Auxiliary verbs, also known as helping verbs, are used to add functional or grammatical meaning to the clause in which they appear. These verbs are the unsung heroes of sentence structure, providing depth and complexity to our simple sentences. Let's dive in with some examples. 
Consider the verbs be, do, and have. These are the primary auxiliary verbs in English. They're like the Swiss Army knives of verbs, versatile and multifunctional. For instance, the auxiliary verb be can be used to form continuous tenses. In the sentence, she is reading a book, is, helps to convey that the action is happening right now. The verb do is often used for emphasis, as in, yes, I do want that last slice of pizza. And have is used to form perfect tenses, as in, I have finished my homework. But these are not the only auxiliary verbs. There are also modal auxiliary verbs like can, could, may, might, shall, should, will, would, must. These verbs express necessity, possibility, prediction or other conditions. We'll delve deeper into these in the next scene. So you see, auxiliary verbs play a crucial role in shaping the meaning of our sentences. They help to convey the tenses, voices and other aspects of the main verb. Without them, our sentences would be flat and lifeless, without nuance or variation. Think of auxiliary verbs as the supporting actors in a play. They're not the stars of the show, but the performance wouldn't be the same without them. They add depth to the plot, provide context and help the main verbs, the stars, shine brighter. Remember that while auxiliary verbs may seem small and insignificant, they carry a lot of weight in our sentences. They help us express complex ideas, emotions and conditions that would be difficult to communicate without them. And that's the beauty of language, isn't it? Even the smallest words can have a big impact. Auxiliary verbs are the supporting actors in our sentences, helping main verbs express complex ideas. Finally, we have modal verbs, the verbs that express necessity or possibility. These verbs are special because they don't just tell us what's happening, but rather they tell us the speaker's attitude towards what's happening. They provide additional information about the function of the main verb that follows them. Let's consider this. We've got a bunch of verbs like can, could, may, might, shall, should, will, would, must. These are all modal verbs. They are used before other verbs to add extra meaning to them. Modal verbs are quite versatile and they often express concepts such as ability, permission, request, offer and so on. For instance, if we say, I can swim, the modal verb can is used to express ability. Similarly, you may leave the room, here may is used to express permission. Modal verbs can also express a degree of certainty. For example, she must be at home by now, where must indicates a high degree of certainty about the statement. Now, let's consider requests and offers. If we say, could you pass me the salt, please? The modal verb could is used to make a polite request. On the other hand, I can help you with that. Here can is used to make an offer. Remember, these verbs are helping us add more layers to our sentences. They're helping us express not just what's happening, but how we feel about it, how certain we are of it, or what we want to happen next. But here's a fun fact. Modal verbs do not change their form according to the subject. Isn't it refreshing not to worry about the S in the third person singular? So the next time you're having a conversation or writing a story, throw in a few modal verbs. They will not only add depth to your language, but also help you express more nuanced ideas and emotions. Modal verbs, in essence, help us express more nuanced ideas and emotions. So there you have it, the four main types of verbs in English. Let's quickly revisit what we've covered. First, we delved into action verbs, the doers in our sentences. They carry the weight of the action, whether it's running, singing or thinking. They're the energetic heartbeat of our conversations and writings. And then we met the linking verbs, the connectors. They don't perform any action. Instead, they link the subject with additional information about it. Often describing states of being or conditions, they're the bridges of our language, quietly connecting the dots. Next, we explored the world of auxiliary verbs, those helpful little words that change, enhance, or clarify the meaning of the main verb. They're the assistants, the supporters, always ready to lend a hand and add depth to our expressions. Lastly, we dove into modal verbs, those special verbs that express necessity, possibility, permission, or ability. They're the speculators, the wishful thinkers, adding shades of possibility and conjecture to our sentences. Each type of verb plays its unique role, and together they form the backbone of English sentences. They carry the action, link ideas, assist main verbs, and express various moods and modalities. With this knowledge, you are now one step closer to mastering English. Remember, understanding verbs is key to expressing yourself accurately and effectively.